Hello, this is Dawn Turner. The following will be a presentation on my findings on James McNeil Whistler. Specifically on Arrangement in Gray and Black, number one, Portrait of the Artist's Mother. To the present day audience, Arrangement in Gray and Black, number one, or the mother, is viewed as very conventional. It seems to illustrate a woman who was conservative, moralistic and closed to new experiences. Now known for its symbol of maternal love, I seek to demonstrate this was far from the intention of the artist. Through Whistler's painting technique, the painting of the mother should be viewed as a modern painting ahead of its time. And while still conforming to aesthetic ideals, did not fit in with the trends of the day. My findings also show the positive, strong influence Anna, Anna Matilda McNeil Whistler had over her son. Before discussing the actual painting, I believe it is important to give a brief history of Anna McNeil Whistler, James Whistler, and his general painting style. Anna McNeil Whistler was born and raised in North Carolina. She was a very devout Christian and relied upon prayer and her relationship with God. However, she was not a closed woman and was open to new experiences. She was married at a relatively late age for that time at 27 years of age. She eventually had five children, though only two, James and William, lived beyond childhood, as well as three stepchildren. While Anna McNeil Whistler did embody the conservative virtues of the day, such as submissiveness, domesticity, and piety, she was also a woman of the world, having lived in St. Petersburg, Russia, as well as Europe with her family. Anna was 45 when her husband died, at which time her fortunes fluctuated for many years. Eventually, at the age of 59, she moved to be near her children and stepchildren in England during the American Civil War. By all accounts, James Whistler was a good-natured but spoiled child. He lived a very fluent lifestyle in St. Petersburg, Russia, and America until his father's death when he was 15. He has suffered from a variety of childhood illnesses and spent a lot of time in bed. I believe this is when he began to cultivate his personality, as he was to make up many stories and tall tales into his adult life. It was during one of these illnesses that his mother provided him with William Hogarth's etchings. He credits these as providing the inspiration and the aspirations for him becoming an artist, and his mother supported him in this. For the times, James and his mother had an unusually close relationship. As he became an established artist, they had an agent-artist relationship, along with her household duties she handled communications and commissions with patrons, as well as all of the finances. As mentioned, she was a devout Christian. However, she was known to arrange parties for his so-called libertine friends. And her favorite was poet Algernon Swinburne, who was also known for his foulness of alcohol. But she didn't mind that. Whistler even owes his iconic butterfly signature that evolved over a 30-year period to Anna based on his initials, J.W., it stems from his mother cautioning him on the dangers of flitting to and fro from one temptation to the next, like the butterfly. I will now briefly discuss aestheticism and how Whistler's own personal aesthetic placed him within that movement. Whistler is well known for his attention to detail in women's dress, and especially in his own style of dress. He was known as the Beau Brummel of art and took that moniker as a compliment. Through his paintings, Whistler is known for bringing life to the social history of women and the way they dressed for the times. In the second half of the 19th century, more women were sitting for portraits than ever. It was a time when a gown could cost as much as a painting. As such, artists tended to use dress as both moral and aesthetic judgments. Whistler demonstrated beauty through materiality of the paint and resisted conventional narrative reading. He continued to have the overarching goal of mastering techniques in pigment and color. As with all of his arrangements and nocturnes, he wanted his paintings to represent a type of harmony, as in music. Whistler was attracted to strong women, and like his mother, he wanted intelligent, long-suffering, and devoted to his genius. The women in his life displayed so-called masculine characteristics, mainly because they managed his financial affairs. 
Other than his mother and sister, there were three main women in his life. Whistler was with Joe Heffernan for eight years. During that time, he painted her many, many times. One of the first was Symphony in White, number one, The White Girl. Notable because it was rejected by the Royal Academy and the Paris Salon. The question around her implied purity and her tousled hair confused European critics. And as usual, they wanted to create their own story, which of course did not fit Whistler's intentions. As always, his, his was a focus on, quote, line, color, and composition, not the subject matter, end quote. The paintings of his other lovers, Maud Franklin, with whom he stayed 14 years, and Beatrix Godwin, the only woman he married and who later died from cancer, were represented in similar fashion in arrangement in white and black and note and red the siesta, respectively. Unlike the mother, the paintings on this page fulfill the use of the female form as art object, loveliness, and fashion trend. These portraits more readily fit into the aesthetic movement. However, as will be discussed later, I believe the mother fits as well. So now on to the iconic arrangement in gray and Blake, black number one, or the mother. It is thought that Whistler's The Mother was influenced by Hellenistic art, specifically the neoclassical figures portrayed in Antonio Casanova's Letizia Ramellino Bonaparte and Agrippina in the Capitol. While unproven, it doesn't hurt that both figures are mothers of Napoleon and Nero, respectively. One thing that is known is that Whistler had a large collection of European portraiture that most likely did provide influences as well. To take it a step for further, Whistler named his portraits by color or arrangement because he wanted each to be seen as visually decorative. He wanted to achieve balance between color and shape. He also showed people from unexpected angles, from the side like the mother, and more often from behind as is demonstrated in the two paintings to the right. The place and setting for Whistler's mother was important. At the time, Whistler and his mother lived in Two Lindsay Row, as is seen in an etching that Whistler sketched. His studio had both Western and Eastern influences. Dark Japanese drapery with minimal furnishings reflected the Eastern influence, while the austere studio and morning dress worn by his mother represented Western influences. The studio was a tonal construct, with the gray background being the key color and low light for minimal shadows. As in his own life, Whistler attempted to contrive his own light. Whistler always saw himself as an innovator. The choice of canvas, as well as the use of thin diluted paint, was important. As it relates to the mother, Whistler used two techniques he learned under the tutelage of Marc Chal Gabriel Glare the importance of line over color, and the use of black as a base tone. One can see the similarities in tone between the mother and Le Soir ou Les Illusions Perdues. At the time, portraits portraying dark backgrounds was not in fashion. Typically bright backgrounds in red were used. Painters at this time were using glossy finishes and thicker strokes of paint. However, the atmosphere created in his arrangement in gray and black number one fits Whistler's aesthetic. In his infamous 10 o'clock lectures, he refers to London and his mother as having, quote, the evening mists that clothe the riverside with poetry, end quote. So Whistler's mother ran counter to the current trend at the time. Many artists and artworks, including Picasso's Demoiselles d'Avignon, Sickert's Camden Town Murder, and Manet's Olympia, were using the female nude, mainly prostitutes, as the so-called breakthrough picture. The mother's own quiet restraint can be seen as a reaction to the extrovert concept of modernity. So the critical reaction to the mother at the time was mixed. It narrowly missed rejection from the Royal Academy exhibition in 1872. Additionally, many were confused by the title of arrangement and thought the focus should be on the so-called subject matter. In his arrangement, 
The goal was not to show the affection he had for his mother. Whistler believed that art should stand alone. He wanted the focus to be on the formal technique of the painting, the line, the color, the form. To that end, the painting was wrapped in the image he held of himself as, quote, an aristocrat of art, pitted against vulgar Philistinism of the mob and sentimentalism of at the core of English taste. That was his goal. So at this point, I will discuss the effect of the mother on other modern artists in popular culture. Before Whistler painted the mother, maternal themes were explored in artworks, but there was never a focus on the actual person, personage of the mother. After the mother, more artists began visualizing their own mother as an individual and also as an individual in a work of art. This is a significant theme that has remained throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. As is illustrated by Umberto Boccioni's futurist Mataria, mothers are de depicted in a more powerful way. As mentioned, more artists such as Edouard Villar were allowing their own autobiography into their artworks. Artists were also using similar compositions for their portraiture as is illustrated by Malaise's Isabella Hugh. Additionally, the color and composition of the mother influence photography of that time. So in the meantime, Whistler's mother has become an icon and part of popular culture. Physically, it has toured the globe numerous times, but it was also aided by Whistler's own knack for marketing and allowing reproductive prints. This allowed versions into the homes of Americans and Europeans. So the next two slides show just a few of the paintings and photographs that have appropriated the mother's form. From Newsweek in 1982, and even the adventures of Rocky and Bullwinkle, to The New Yorker in 1996, and most recently in January of 2013, photographer Aline Smith used her mother as muse in her own arrangements in green and black, portrait of the photographer's mother. Included here are her arrangements, number 10 and 14. So should arrangement in gray and black number one be considered a modern painting or simply a symbol of conservatism? I believe my findings align with my original thesis. I believe it is due to its subject matter that has been overlooked. Through Whistler's painting techniques, I believe it should be viewed as a modern painting ahead of the trends of the time, meaning it was not on trend with other British aesthetic representations of the female form, but it also reflected the aesthetic sensibility of art for art's sake. It also fits in the 20th and 21st centuries in that, like Whistler, the mother has assumed a variety of personalities and fits with his own cult of personality and tendencies toward publicity. Finally, I would like to leave you with this. In Whistler and his mother, an unexpected relationship, Sarah Walden writes, after his death in 1903, the voice of the Academy, which had held him at arm's length, decided the artist had a, quote, silent pathfinder who chose his own way. And the way was strange and untrodden, brilliantly rendering on canvas things that others would have thought not paintable or too difficult to essay in a wonder of dim paint, end quote. Ultimately, I believe from an aesthetic, technical, and intellectual standpoint of view, arrangement in gray and black number one accurately represents movements in art at the time. On the next two slides, I have references and resources used. And finally, I hope that you found my findings thus far informative, and thank you so much for your time.